just because it's better does not mean it's more valuable. Problem with stable coins is Tether. <laughs> Tether is the biggest stable coin. People use it every day, but we don't know if Tether is safe. I can't send you a million dollars of PayPal. PayPal will flip out. Problem is you're sort of playing with hot potato here. Bitcoin is something that I think 50 or 100 years from now, we're not gonna be thinking about as, as something that uh, lasted the test of time. I think we're, we're still waiting for that technology. We're all sort of agreeing that Bitcoin is worth something and, and you have this sort of greater fool theory that is also present in fiat, but feels a little sillier here because anybody who's programmed a database or, or spun up a Postgres knows that you know you have a lot of entries in the database and they're not worth anything. I am sort of an anti-DeFi person. I don't think it'd be useful to try to replicate the banking system off-chain or on-chain or something like that. Most of these tokens are going to be valueless. Most of these tokens are, are going to be worthless. But uh, just as the internet stocks, most of them did become worthless. Most of the stocks we shorted did go to zero. And I think that's the other thing people sort of need to understand about crypto is that it's sort of a subsector of software, but it's, it's sort of a, a property. If we can get tokenized stocks and bonds and other tokenized assets, we can really start to see people trading stocks on chain. The last six months have been pretty chaotic for crypto. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we're learning is that uh, crypto will will not be ended by Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, this technology is bigger and more important than any one person. Uh, having said that, it's sort of um, the crypto world's Lehman or Madoff or Galleon, depending on how you look at it moment. So everyone knows what Lehman Brothers was. It was sort of this investment bank that sort of went too far with risk and kind of pushed the envelope to get return on depositors' money. And there was a run in the bank and it was sort of a, a house of cards. And that's more or less what FTX was. But there's some elements of Madoff in there too. Madoff was a purported hedge fund that actually didn't invest its clients' money. It just put it in a drawer. And that was actually kind of a better case than FTX because the clients were able to actually get their money back because all they had to do is look in the drawer, right? Uh, Madoff spends some of the money, but you really can't spend billions and billions of dollars that easily. So um, a lot of that money was actually recovered. Unfortunately, the returns were not recovered because the returns were fictitious. And then there was Galleon, which was a hedge fund that um, was run by uh, a guy named Raj Rajaratnam that uh, was a systematic market cheater uh, using insider trading. And, um, you know, in essence, you know, uh, I think FTX sort of has a mix of, of all of those. Uh, in any event, uh, the implosion of FTX, I think, uh, actually kind of guides us in a, in a better direction. And it's actually kind of, I think, a bullish event. Um, and the reason is I think we're sort of applying this technology in the wrong ways. Feeding everybody the opportunity to get crypto was sort of uh, FTX's goal. And I think that that's not such a horrible thing, but it's sort of not what the industry is. It's sort of the tail wagging the dog. I think the, the utility of the actual software itself is, is the most important thing. The access to that software uh, should be, to some extent, seamless. Uh, and for people to directly speculate on um, the price of the tokens that the software is related to, I think is not the, the key. I think if you think about how we use software like Windows or the internet or something like that, we don't you know, sort of think about financializing that and spec using it to speculate or, or thinking about how do I how do I speculate on the internet as a stock or as a, as a financial investment? We use the internet because we like to use the internet, and uh, the financial part around it is sort of window dressing. It's not the the whole thing. So I think that the bubble of people, the average person wanting to get into crypto, I think that's a bubble that is bursting, has burst, and hopefully never come back. Uh, I think that the focus of crypto should be on the software, not on people speculating. Um, and certainly the NFT bubble is sort of a prime example of that, where you have this sort of cartoonization uh, and financialization of, of art, which, um, you know, from a purist and an artistic perspective has, has certainly been around for a long time, but the NFT world sort of took that and magnified it into a, something that couldn't be sustained. And I think the same thing can't be sustained. I don't think that people should be buying Bitcoin um, on exchanges. I don't think that, you know, this is really going to work in the long run. I do think that crypto and its uh, attendant technology has, has a really important role to play in software. But I don't think that, you know, um, you know, everybody should have a crypto account the same way they have a stock account and things like that. So I know that a lot of people think I'm a crypto evangelist. It's hard to label me. I have opinions. You know, some of them you're going to like, some of them you're not going to like and, you know, take it as it is. So crypto uh, to me is an asset class similar to other asset classes. So if you look at stocks, bonds or whatever, you have to sort of look at 
each element of that asset class. I don't think you can look at the aggregate. And I think a lot of people focus on the aggregate here more than they focus on the aggregate. You don't see a lot of people talking about, oh, what's the market cap of aggregate market cap of stocks and, and you know, or the, even the aggregate market cap of one sector of stocks. I actually had to look some of this stuff up because it was, I, I, I wasn't familiar with it, but I know the specific market cap of specific stocks really closely. I follow that really, really closely. So I think that for crypto, for whatever reason, we tend to look at the aggregate more than we look at the individual. And I think that's probably a mistake and that each individual um, sort of asset is important uh, to look at by itself. The aggregate market cap right now uh, is, is 870 billion. And you can see sort of a chart of it. Um, what's interesting is that this was the same market cap after a brief bubble in, in 18. Um, and it just sort of goes to show you that lots of stock sort of indices, uh, whether it's S&P 500 or this, um, they tend to sort of uh, have these bubbles that take years for recovery. And the 18 bubble took years to recover, to only three years. And the 22 bubble could take 10, 15, 20 years if it ever comes back. And it may never come back. For context, you know, trying to understand, you know, what um, what is a eight hundred billion dollars, right? We we don't have a lot of context to number that big. Obviously, there's some companies that big, so some of the biggest companies in the world, um, Apple and others, are, are larger than that, but but not by an order of magnitude. So you can think of all of crypto as equal to something like a Microsoft or half of one Microsoft or or something like that. The, the more interesting context, if you look at all the real estate on the planet, it's about two hundred to 300 trillion, all the debt is around the same size. All the money is about 100 trillion. So crypto as sort of a money uh, replacement has, you could think of it as, you know, if you add, take Bitcoin and stable coin together, maybe half of 1% of a replacement for all the money in the world, which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Uh, if you look at all the stocks, you're talking about a, a 100 trillion. More interestingly, if you look at all the software stocks, this is something that I think nobody's talked about. And I think this is really, really important. Uh, crypto is software. Some of crypto is wants to be finance. So I put that in here as well. But if you think about what is crypto at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a new software stack. It's a new API. It's a new set of tools, not unlike a new set of tools that we've seen in other software revolutions, whether it's object oriented programming or, or TCP IP, or uh, even recently things like reactive web programming or, uh, any new paradigm that sort of comes about, we sort of get to use that as software engineers and software entrepreneurs and try to create value with it. Ultimately, if you think about crypto as roughly 8% of all software, that's kind of a really interesting way to look at it. And then if you extrude sort of Bitcoin and stable coins, that non-stable, non-Bitcoin, that's about 400 billion. So that's 4% of all software. And that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. That doesn't sound too crazy. Again, I am sort of an anti- um, DeFi person until DeFi starts to sort of embody real world assets. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But like, I, I think DeFi is, is not the place So like this, the financial stocks are, are not, you know, kind of what I think crypto is going to be useful for. I don't think that, uh, you know, it'd be useful to try to replicate the banking system off chain or on chain or something like that. It's possible that DeFi can play a role, but I don't think DeFi in its current form, which is basically just the sort of derivatization and um, ease of liquefying kind of the rest of the crypto ecosystem. I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I think that if we use this technology to liquefy and derivatize the rest of the financial assets of the world, like all the other stuff on this list, that makes a lot more sense. Tokenized stocks, tokenized commodities, those are the kind of things that I think make a lot of sense for, for DeFi. So in Bitcoin, I'm bearish. Uh, I think it's a uh, you know, sort of a, a poor attempt to financialize a database. I think that um, it's not a bad idea, but but I think that, you know, it's a really slow database is one of the problems and that Satoshi couldn't in envision sort of the, the uptake, um, you know, that, that sort of Bitcoin, um, I guess, received. And I think it's, it's, the, its biggest flaw is this sort of distribution. So it's, its biggest asset becomes its biggest flaw. You, you have this fractured development community that can't decide on, on a direction. So there's no way to upgrade software. If you can't upgrade software, you're really stuck with um, old software. And if you think about the patching software, or upgrading software, even open source software is able to do that. Um, even software that's not quote unquote owned by anybody is able to do that. And I think that that's where you need either a visionary that you can trust or some trusted distribution system that allows for rapid sort of execution of updates. And, and Bitcoin has neither of that. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, 
the artificial scarcity concept. I know people like to say, well, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin forever and ever. And I think that's a little silly because, I mean, it could take this piece of paper and cut it into 10 pieces and say there's only going to be 10 pieces of this paper forever and ever. And it, it's just sort of a canard. You know, I think that money can, it, it, writ large, can can sort of benefit from new technology. There's no doubt that our money system is, is sort of stuck in the Stone Ages. And I enjoyed uh, onboarding into Bitcoin a long time ago because it, it was sort of a magical ability. Uh, for me, it felt like email for money, uh, magical ability to transmit sort of something of value. The problem is you're sort of playing with hot potato here. Um, we're all sort of agreeing that Bitcoin is worth something and, and you have this sort of greater fool theory that is also present in fiat, but feels a little sillier here because anybody who's programmed a database or, or spun up a Postgres knows that, you know, you have a lot of entries in the database and they're not worth anything um, and they're immutable and you can set them to be immutable <laughs> and all this stuff. It doesn't mean that it's valuable. And I think that um, we're going to see Bitcoin as a relic kind of the same way we view hieroglyph hieroglyphics or old tape drives, maybe. Um, we're, we already have superior products, new products will be developed. I think this origin story with Satoshi will seem less magical over time because I think that, you know, we sort of will start to gather that while well, Satoshi was the first to, to create Bitcoin and, and create the first distributed currency, there were a lot of proto cryptos and a lot of sort of other technologies around the hoop. And again, we don't sort of think about um, greenbacks, which were pre-dollar uh, dollars. We don't think about Wampum, which was one of the first fiat currencies um, in, in the U.S. or the first fiat currency in the U.S. You probably don't even know what that is and, you know, or, or uh, die stones or, or other sort of, you know, ways to sort of change the technology of money. So I think that Bitcoin is something that I think 50 or 100 years from now, we're not going to be thinking about as as something that uh, lasted the test of time. I think we're, we're still waiting for that technology. So anyway, embarrassment on Bitcoin. That doesn't mean I think it's going to go down tomorrow. That doesn't mean I think it's going to go down this week or this month or this year. If Bitcoin doubles from here, I'm not going to feel stupid. Um, you know, this is just a long term call on sort of the technology and so forth. It doesn't mean you should do anything. It doesn't mean that I should do anything. It's just something that, um, you know, is sort of represents my thoughts. So Ethereum is, is the second largest uh, crypto. It's about 150 billion market cap. Uh, I'm more neutral on Ethereum and I'm not, I'm not bullish, uh, but I'm not really bearish either. So Ethereum has a much stronger development roadmap and, and unfortunately than Bitcoin. Unfortunately, that's the trade-off, right? Is you have this single visionary and you have a lot of risk that this one person gets it wrong. Um, uh, we're talking about Vitalik Buterin. Um, so obviously I think uh, very highly of Vitalik. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, he's sort of obviously getting it right so far. You know, uh, Ethereum is now worth about half of what Bitcoin is worth. And I do think eventually you'll see that flip. Uh, Ethereum will be worth more than Bitcoin. Uh, I think that pair trade is actually really good. I think you can, you can be long Ethereum and short Bitcoin, but I don't think you want to be beta, have beta exposure to crypto. Um, just like I don't think you should have beta exposure to stocks. Um, you know, so it doesn't mean buy Ethereum. It means if you're going to bet on Ethereum, Bitcoin sort of uh, spread, I, I think that spread will sort of contract in favor of Ethereum. You know, we see Facebook right now. Mark Zuckerberg is a visionary. He's really amazing. He's one of the most successful capitalists ever, but he's making a big bet on the metaverse. He could be wrong and he could take the company down with him or he could be right and he'd be the biggest company of all time. We just don't know. Sort of the same thing's happening with Ethereum where... Right now, Ethereum is riding high, but all it takes is, is Vitalik to make one strategic blunder, and not even in technology, but in communication. And so it's very hard to not only create new technology, but also to sell it and to sustain momentum. It's really an almost impossible task, which is why it's so hard. So anyway, uh, Ethereum has worked out really well because there's a ton of uh, utility uh, vis-a-vis Bitcoin, and certainly a huge ecosystem that, like, for example, the ERC-20 ecosystem that's been built off of uh, Ethereum. But... Just because it's better does not mean it's more valuable. And I, I want you to understand that uh, when it comes to stocks and crypto, it's the same thing. Just because something's amazing, and Ethereum is really amazing, it's priced to be amazing. It's 150 billion market cap. So what's what do you get for $150 billion? Well, there are about, I listed about 10 companies here that trade for $150 billion. UPS, Intel, Bristol Myers, Texas Instruments, Qualcomm, Nike, Salesforce.com, Adobe, and Disney. You've probably heard of, of, if not nine out of those nine companies, uh, eight, seven or eight of them. Um, probably most of you have heard of all, all nine of them. These are really household names. Uh, and they're all companies that make somewhere between seven to $15 billion a year. So Ethereum's got a big sort of uh, shoot to fill with that market cap. And I think it's it's sort of filling it, but it doesn't mean that you know necessarily there's, there's a lot more upside. So 
I think Ethereum is kind of a, a a great technology, but I'm not sure it's a great investment. So stable coins, I, I think, are the most incredible innovation that this space has brought. Uh, I think distributed compute with ERC-20 is really valuable. I think Bitcoin is sort of this first unveiling of crypto, as I said, is sort of was, was sort of a, a very neat uh, thing, uh, but now sort of, I think, a flash in the pan compared to what uh, we're able to do today. But crypto um, should be really proud of stable coins. I think the stable coins are, are really the first killer app that that are, you know, is truly uh, a site to behold because being able to send money around the world very quickly is something that if you're, at least if you're in the US, whether you're a rich individual, a poor individual or a corporation is extremely difficult. Um, banks have a lot of control. Uh, it's if you have a corporate account, uh, uh, I, was, I had a publicly traded company sending a million dollars from the US to say Switzerland or to uh, any country in the world is, is almost impossible. It's, uh, it's wrought with uh, all kinds of issues and it, it's very slow and um, you know, stable coins solve a lot of those problems. They create other problems, obviously. There's no refund if you send stable coin to the wrong place. Uh, there's uh, other issues. But in general, I think that um, stable coins are an incredible innovation that, you know, people always ask, well, what, what's crypto useful for? What, what, what good is it? And I think anytime somebody asks that question, you can simply say um, stable coins. And if they say, well, why do I need stable coin? You can say, well, try to send me $10,000 right now or try to send me $100 right now or whatever amount of money. And they'll say, well, do you have a PayPal account? And if you have a PayPal account, you may be able to do that, but you also have to comply with PayPal's terms and services. Um, if you've ever been canceled off of PayPal uh, for no reason, that wants PayPal's opportunity and, and their ability, I'm sorry, it's their prerogative to, to cancel you if they feel like it. So, um, you know, you could just not pay your bill on PayPal or whatever reason, PayPal has canceled your account and you're done. And so uh, you also have onboarding and off boarding for, for uh, PayPal. It's not like it's the last stop. You still have to sort of take your PayPal and move it to, to your bank, which I, admittedly is relatively easy. But I think that, you know, no matter what system you're using there, it's, it's, there are limits. You can't, I can't send you a million dollars of PayPal. PayPal will flip out. Uh, every time I used to use PayPal, even though I had quite a lot of money in, in my PayPal and things like that, I couldn't send more than, than a fraction of my PayPal account to somebody. So again, all these limits that are placed on um, people, uh, PayPal can review your account, suspend it for any reason. All those things are, are sort of a silly, um, you know, feature of uh, these companies sort of protecting themselves. And again, sometimes we kind of want those consumer protections. If you sent a million dollars to the wrong account, uh, you definitely would expect your bank to send it back. You wouldn't expect that in crypto. So. In any event, I think that's important. The problem with stable coins is Tether. <laughs> Tether is the biggest stable coin. People use it every day, but we don't know if Tether is safe. Uh, it seems to me like there's a risk of a catastrophic event with Tether, which would be, uh, needless to say, really bad for the crypto world. I do think that we would um, survive that, uh, albeit it would be it'd be devastating. Uh, and I do think these other sort of stable coins seem to be uh, less at risk uh, than Tether, like USD coin. But I do think... Um, you know, Tether has a has some hair on it, and uh, we don't know if 100 cents of Tether is worth 100 cents. Um, I also think the stablecoin model is a little awkward in the sense that Tether gets to keep all of the interest income from this um, from these stablecoins, so they have 60 billion dollars allegedly sitting in a bank somewhere, and in this interest rate environment, that's about two billion dollars of income. Uh, so they get to pocket that income, even though it's our money. At least the banks pretend that they give us some amount of. Uh, uh, of our interest. So, you know, I think stable coins are a really important innovation, but we're still in sort of version one of stable coins. And I, I think that we'll see version two and version three at some point. And, you know, the people that sort of put together uh, yield bearing stable coins and things like that will, will do really The non stable coins and non Bitcoin Ethereum market cap is about 230 billion. And this is sort of the sector a lot of people focus on because um, you have sort of the potential for a new Bitcoin or a new Ethereum or something like that. And there's a couple of contenders for that. And we, we still don't kind of really know who will emerge from this. But this is to me is like the stock market, right? You have hundreds, if not thousands of these different tokens, they all do different things. And um, in aggregate, they're worth 200 something billion. So which one is going to go up? Which one's going to go down? I don't know. Um, uh, your guess is as good as mine. That's what a stock analyst uh, or a crypto analyst does, spends all their time thinking about each one of these. I'm an entrepreneur. I certainly keep tabs on a lot of these, but I don't sit there and do this for a living. Uh, my living is, is as a software entrepreneur. So, um, but the crypto I do like are, are cryptos with real world utility and value. And that's a very sort of small fraction of, of crypto. So I listed sort of, let's see here, 15 
of the top 200 that I thought were, were sort of passable. Uh, and I'm not sort of saying that these are specifically um, cryptos I would jump out and buy tomorrow. I think they're, they're cryptos that I sort of ideologically am aligned with. Um, so I, I'm not trying to say that these are sort of good values, um, which you know is a totally different question from are these good technologies. And so it sort of tells you that within the top 200 cryptos, I have 15 that I'll even sort of think about as useful. And of those 15, I'm not sure what percentage of those are good buys, maybe half, maybe a quarter, maybe 10% of them. So you're really talking about of 200 cryptos, maybe two, one or two are a good buy and 199 are not. So that sort of tells you something about crypto. And I don't think that's a problem. You know, in, in 2000, I was uh, working at a hedge fund and the internet was coming of age from a stock market financialization perspective. The internet was coming of age probably about six or seven years ago for the mainstream. Um, you know, and certainly was coming of age 10 or 15 years ago for, for academics and, and government. So in any event, the internet was all people could talk about, uh, the new economy, e-commerce. Uh, this was everything on the, on, on, uh, in 2000. Uh, and, and the hedge fund I worked at was wisely, um, this was Jim Cramer's hedge fund for anybody who, who doesn't know that story. Uh, that hedge fund was, was wisely short uh, all of the uh, technology stocks uh, on the menu in the stock market. And I think that was a really good call. And it sort of reminds me of this, which is like most of these tokens are going to be valueless. Most of these tokens are, are going to be worthless. But the Internet, uh, just as the Internet stocks, most of them did become worthless. Most of the stocks we shorted did go to zero. Uh, even the good stocks went down 90 percent. So ultimately, I think that, you know, the Internet survived. We know the story. And now software in general survived. And, uh, you know, we we're, every software company uses the Internet in some form. And uh, the Internet did change the world. It didn't change people's financial worlds. And again, I don't think the average person should be jumping in to uh, an E-Trade account in 2000 trying to figure out which e-commerce or Internet stock to buy. That didn't work. The same, re the same thing and the same reason, this is now post-mortem mostly, that people shouldn't be jumping into crypto and trying to figure out which token is going to work. We don't know. And the odds are slim that you're going to get it right. So the, the handful of cryptos that I like, I listed them out here, and you'll see a theme. Uh, BNB, uh, Matic, Algo, Filecoin, ICP, Aptos, uh, Graph, uh, BAT, Basic Attention Token, RWE, VNS, uh, OP, Golem, StoreJ, Render, uh, RLC, which very few people know, and then API3. These are 15 tokens that they all sort of do something, whether it's they do a computation, they store a file, uh, they sort of route something important. Um, you know, they're all these sort of unique uh, value, real value, real world utility software sort of systems. Um, and I think that's, that's what differentiates them. The other 190 cryptos of the top 200, I think are probably gonna be worthless. And I think that, um, you know, we really are, are sort of struggling as, as an industry. And I, I don't say this as the crypto industry because I don't think that exists the same way the, nobody thinks about the internet industry as sort of a subsector of, of software. This is just software. And I think that's the other thing people sort of need to understand about crypto is that it's sort of a subsector of software, but it's, it's sort of a, a property. We don't think about, oh, the companies that use object-oriented programming or the companies that use non-SQL databases or right? the companies that use, you know, uh, uh, this uh, specific framework, uh, you know, these, this is just a tool. You know, if your company can use the tool, great. If it can't use the tool, that's fine too. Uh, I think every software company should be thinking about, can they use crypto? Can they use some elements of these technologies to enhance their software? Uh, but I don't think that, you know, uh, you can look at the software without its applications. Uh, and it's hard to build primitives uh, or rails or protocols or whatever and monetize them. I think that's, that's really difficult because in essence, you could take the same computation and generally remove the token uh, for a lot of these uh, projects or concepts. Uh, so sometimes you can't, obviously, computation is expensive, uh, storage is expensive, uh, but sometimes you can if you think about sort of some, some of these that require pretty minimal um, infrastructures. Um, they're, they're more like a open source projects that are, have a, a financialization stapled onto them. So I generally don't uh, believe, like, like I mentioned, in DeFi. I do think DeFi 2.0 or 3.0 will be pretty cool. If we can get tokenized stocks and bonds and other tokenized assets, we can really start to see people trading stocks on chain. Uh, I think that'd be really great. Obviously, the SEC doesn't like that idea. Um, so, um, you know, I think it'll be really tricky to sort of get there. I do think sort of some permissionless stock trading system would be incredible. Um, it's a very sort of uh, tough nut to crack. Um, but I think that'd be a really, really neat thing. Until then, I don't think it makes sense that we financialize 
crypto. So we already have something really risky so uh, and, and speculative in these tokens. So to make a financial system that enhances the ability to speculate on these tokens, I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know that we need leverage on this stuff. I don't know that we need loans on this stuff. <laughs> I don't think we need any of that. And you're sort of taking smart ideas and smart technology and putting them on the wrong foundation. I think you need a good foundation. And a good foundation would be things like real estate, stocks, currencies, things like that. I don't think we need an ability to lend out my Algorand, you know, or something like that. I think that's that's probably too risky.